Hello, everyone, and welcome to our seminar on developmental trauma, psychosis, and neurofeedback. My name is Mirjana Askovic, and I'm director of the Australian Neurofeedback Institute. I'll be your MC today. ANFI was initiated in early 2019 as a social enterprise of the New South Wales Service for the Treatment and Rehabilitation of Torture and Trauma Survivors. Um, this social enterprise, uh, our institute was formed to help us uh, raise revenues to support our clients who are refugees and asylum seekers so that they can continue to access neurofeedback and AG services in our uh, centre. Uh, we are leaders in the field of neurofeedback and uh, trauma in Australia, and we have more than 30 years of experience in working with clients with very chronic and complex presentations. Today's webinar is organized by us on behalf of Headspace Early Psychosis. Headspace Early Psychosis is funded by Commonwealth Government and provided by Paramatta Mission to support young people who have experienced their first psychotic episode or at high risk to develop psychosis. On behalf of Headspace and ANFI, I would like to acknowledge traditional custodians of this land on which we stand. I would also like to pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, if there are any in our audience today. The aim of today's webinar is to raise awareness of the effectiveness of developmental trauma, on the effects of developmental trauma and its contribution to development of psychosis. We have four panelists with us today, and also we have Stephen Fisher, who is our guest from US, that you will just have a chance to see briefly. Um, and we will talk about important advances in treating clients with these complex presentations. And also we will present some clinical and research data. So not to keep you waiting, I would like first to introduce our first panelist. It's my pleasure to introduce Roger Gurr. He's a clinical director at Headspace Early Psychosis. Uh, and he also initiated this seminar. Thank you, Roger. Roger is conjoint associate professor of psychiatry at uh, Western Sydney University. He is board chair of New South Wales Service for Treatment and Rehabilitation of Torture and Trauma Survivors. He was previously director of mental health for Western Sydney Area Health Service, Western Sydney Local Health District, and also Nepean Blue Mountains Local Health District. So, Roger, this is a long career, a lot of work that you've done in your time, and also a lot of good that you brought to all services that you worked. And for your work, it starts with my service. I'm really grateful to you. So, the mic is yours now. Well, good morning, everybody. This uh, webinar has several purposes. It's to introduce our new research project, it's also about what needs to happen across mental health services. It's an illustration also of a personal journey that created a unique set of circumstances for an idea to flourish. Now, I've had a long career in mental health, but it's only been in the last five years that a clearer picture has emerged about how best to invest my remaining time. From being a personally traumatized person by being born gay in a more hostile era 74 years ago, and having managed Amnesty International Australia through the 1980s, while campaigning for community-based mental health care in Blacktown, I became acutely aware of the need for a local refugee trauma treatment service. So in 1988, I initiated STARTS, and as you said, I chair the board. Now, I've also tried changing the public mental health system from within, as Area Director of Mental Health for Western Sydney Area Health Service from 2005 to 12, I discovered that's not possible due to vested interests. So I was eventually driven out for too strongly defending the community mental health budget from diversion to physical health in the hospitals. So I went back to clinical work in my beloved Blacktown, and then my current role came along in January 2015, and I discovered the developmental trauma walking through the doors of the Headspace primary care sites. I was shocked at the severity of their symptoms. The fact that in spite of the best efforts of the minimal staff, there are insufficient means to care for them, 
and few services wanting to take them on. Then I noticed that the young people registered in our Headspace Early Psychosis were also highly traumatised. However, a really great discovery was that the Headspace Early Psychosis program that provides the best possible platform to apply new treatments for trauma as an add-on to a world best practice model with adequate funding and a recovery focus. Finally, there was fertile ground for action as Parramatta Mission and Wentworth Healthcare shared our vision and their values said, go for it. So I'm unashamedly a campaigner and I'll not stop until we effect are effectively treating developmental trauma. Thus, this webinar is aimed at the interested public as well as clinicians. And I hope that you all get something out of it. For those who want more detail on aspects of our presentations, we will not only give you access to the recordings of today, but we will place additional reference materials on the website. So don't worry if you have to drop out at any time. Now, there's been growing interest in the effects of trauma on mental uh, well-being and the need for trauma-informed care. But what have not received the same attention are the effects of trauma on physical illness as the brain controls everything. There's a lack of understanding the connection between the dysregulation of the brain by trauma and the severity of mental and physical health. Excuse me, here I have a little technical problem changing the slide. Developmental trauma can be defined as all those harmful experiences from conception until the brain matures around age 25, plus traumatic memories passed on through generations via epigenetic memory processes. It's also been called childhood maltreatment or complex trauma, but I think, along with key researchers, that developmental trauma is a much better diagnostic label. So despite the decade of the brain being the 1990s and the National Institute of Mental Health in the USA decision to only fund research that connects to brain function, another 20 years have passed. The psychiatry is still largely working with symptom clusters with no clear connection to brain function. But I think there's a real common uh, starting point because what we see is that um, researchers are looking at correlations with schizophrenia, such as inflammation, while other research is showing correlation between trauma and inflammation. But to me, if you look at the literature, it really shows that the starting point is brain dysregulation from developmental trauma. It interacts with genes, leading to dysregulated biorhythms, hormonal and immune systems, with the resulting symptoms being specific to that person. So that is also why there's a dose-related correlation between the severity of traumas and the severity of symptoms, whatever diagnosis disorder appears. And the reduction of lifespan can be up to 20 years. So children exposed to interpersonal, victimita interpersonal victimization often meet criteria for psychiatric disorders based on genetic predisposition. So for example, the genetic risk for schizophrenia is 32% and epigenetic risk 68%. So a lot of research effort goes into biological research and treatments, such as medications, but they don't cure the conditions. Now is the time to look at the major component, the 68% epigenetic risk. Symptoms include mood and behavior dysregulation, disturbances of consciousness and cognition, alterations in attribution and schema, and interpersonal impairment. Currently, multiple comorbid diagnoses based on symptom clusters are necessary, but not necessarily accurate, leading to both undertreatment and overtreatment with a failure to actually treat the underlying effects of developmental trauma. Most psychiatric and psychological research has not assessed the levels of developmental trauma and taken it into account in their analysis or conclusions. So in a review of uh, found 29 specialist mental health services that had screened for PTSD in adult patients, no matter what main diagnosis was given, around 30% scored positively, but only 2.3% had it mentioned in their case notes and no service actually treated the PTSD. But as PTSD is only a subset of responses to trauma, many more were missed and probably not treated for emotional abuse, attachment disorders and neglect. 
Why is this so? This is a story for another day. But you'll understand why I think most mental health research is highly confounded. Developmental trauma is probably the most unified course of disorder, but the one given the least specific treatment. Efforts continue to try to bundle symptoms with labels like PTSD, complex trauma, complex PTSD. But the psychiatric presentations connected to trauma cover the whole spectrum of disorders and many physical health disorders. So thank goodness technology has now provided the means to assess brain function and to re-regulate brain activity and effectively treat the effects of developmental trauma. So in this webinar, we will provide you with a summary of the evidence based for this conclusion. STARTS annually treats around 7,500 refugees of all ages and with every type of trauma. So Sheila Murdoch will take you through their learnings. After a short uh, break, Mariana Askovic and Vivek Sharma will summarise evidence around EEG analysis and EEG neurofeedback, especially as it relates to our young people in Headspace Early Psychosis at Penrith. And to better understand our research project design, Aidan Anik will also give a brief description of the uh, protocol. But before we get into the brain science, I need to discuss the dismal science of economics. It's been said that we can effectively treat developmental trauma. Uh, sorry, that if we can effectively treat developmental trauma, it'll be the greatest public health achievement of all time. Now, while some may argue sanitation might beat it, there are very good reasons for this opinion. So in the ACE studies in America, uh, run by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, it concluded that child maltreatment was the most costly public health issue in the United States calculating the overall cost exceeds those of cancer or heart disease, and that eradicating child abuse in America would reduce the overall rate of depression by more than half, alcoholism by two thirds, and suicide, serious drug use, and domestic violence by three quarters. So we could stop a lot of suicides uh, more effectively using um, taking into account these issues. So it's such an important issue because the high level of prevalence in our community so if you just look at the right-hand column there, uh, you can see that there are very high percentages of people in the population with those different uh, adverse child events. And if you actually look at um, a collection of um, comparisons, here's five states plus Alaska. So it's really looking at the data from six states in the United States. And if you actually then sum the percentages, you find that three or more types of adverse experiences totals 24%. And to have three types you know, is clearly significant. But if you have uh, um, four or more types of trauma, it comes up to 17%. And that's very significant effects on mental and physical health. And if you have more than six or more types of uh, trauma, life expectancy is reduced by 20 years, as we would note in many of our Indigenous communities. New South Wales government commissioned a fascinating actuarial study producing the Forecasting Futures Outcomes Report in 2018. Analysis of 8 million data items in the government databases for all children and young people aged under 25 and projected showed that 7% of the population was forecasted to use 50% of the state resources or $428 billion by the age of 40. So looking at the relevant groups, to me, they all have suffered significant developmental trauma. And you see on the screen the costs of each individual uh, in those different categories. But there are also there are a thousand individuals who cost $2.3 million each. Wouldn't it be just great to be given the challenge to analyze and treat those dysregulated brains? But closer to home, uh, we also had a longitudinal study um, done in New Zealand, where they had a prospective study commencing uh, with 1,037 consecutive births in Dunedin 47 years ago, with assiduous follow-up every few years, and they still achieve about 95% follow-up rate. And this has produced similar results. So assessed at the age of three, a segment of the low socioeconomic status, child maltreatment, low IQ, or childhood self, uh, low self-control, which compromised... Um, 22% of the whole um, cohort, uh, that accounted for about 80% of social and economic costs by the age of 38. 
Interestingly, 12.7% had received the diagnosis of PTSD, and that would not include the other types of trauma responses. And we also know with PTSD, it's basically defined as black or white in the DSM, whereas STARTS knows it's, it's a whole gradation. So there have been many Australian studies costing different aspects of the effects of developmental trauma that entirely support this uh, thorough New South Wales report, which only covers state government costs. But there would be additional economic benefits of treatment through reduced workers' compensation and accident claims, private health insurance costs, and other insurance. So if we could only save 1% of those state costs, it would save the taxpayers of New South Wales around $535 per resident. We will present uh, to you evidence from studies that I think would lead to massive savings and make the investment of $1 per resident per year for a pilot developmental trauma treatment service a no-brainer. So we now come on to some of the research issues. And despite the long history of research you'll soon hear about, there's a real need for more targeted research. Because we work in a program that gives an excellent base of international best practice in treating first episode psychosis to assess and specifically treat developmental trauma in our young people means that what we do is a clear add-on, not confounded by poor service delivery or underfunded like the state mental health system. But to rush to highly specif uh, specific controlled study is premature for two reasons. When we look at our young people, their presentations are highly diverse with many comorbidities. So we need to get a better understanding of relevant factors to drive the next stage of research design. And to apply EEG recording analysis and EEG neurofeedback, we need funding for additional clinicians with the appropriate skills. And they're very hard to find to work with young people in trauma. But thank goodness Wentworth Healthcare, the provider of the Nepean Blue Mountains Primary Health Network, had the vision to back us with our 30-person case series. Thank goodness Starts recently set up the Australian Neurofeedback Institute to train clinicians with a connection to treating trauma and to provide mentoring for our process, project. And thank goodness two excellent doctors who had got themselves trained in EEG analysis and neurofeedback feedback uh, set up a practice in Blacktown so we could grab one of them, Dr Vivek Sharma. So that's enough from me now, and I'll pass it back to Mariana. Roger, thank you so much for you know, organizing this seminar, for initiating the whole process. And it's what you said about the uh, you know, impact that development trauma has on young people. And oh, if it's not treated, how much of damage that does. And, uh, what life they live if uh, the developmental trauma is not addressed, it really shows the importance of looking for other approaches that can be effective in, in, in helping them recover. So now I would like to invite Sheila Murdoch. Sheila will talk more about what we do at STARTS and to show us how we use different approaches to help our young clients. Sheila Murdoch is a senior team leader at STARTS. She's also um, ANFI deputy director. Uh, Sheila has worked with uh, clinicians uh, as, as, as a clinician and as a clinical supervisor and mentor at STARTS since 1998. And she's, since 2007, Sheila assisted in development of STARTS Neurofeedback Clinic. So welcome, Sheila. Thank you. Thanks, Mirena. Thanks, Roger. That was quite amazing. Um, and um, I will actually take you on the further journey if my sharing works. Uh, here we go. I think this is the one. Share. So I hope you can see the one that doesn't have notes in it. Let me know if you can't. Um, Okay, so I'm going to be talking about our experience and starts. And I really want to take you through the journey of the clients that we actually see at starts. So what 
I need to let you know is it started a service for the treatment and rehabilitation of torture and trauma survivors. And I know that initially, Mariana talked about starts briefly. However, probably not everyone was um, available at the time to listen to this. We are specialist service. We are a non-profit organization started working in 1988. We have provided culturally relevant psychological treatment and support and community interventions to people and communities to heal from scars of torture and trauma and rebuild their lives in Australia. We have around 200 staff, uh, probably a bit less now, and our staff comes from all different uh, diverse cultural backgrounds, probably around different 40 diverse backgrounds. We probably have seen more than 75,000 people now because my data is maybe a year or so old. And we have services through the whole New South Wales um, and also rural and regional areas. One thing that's important to mention about STARTS is that we use the biopsychosocial model in working with clients. That model uh, looks at biological, psychological and social impact of trauma. It also um, mocks quite well the systemic approach uh, framework where this model fits quite well when working with individuals, families, support networks, refugee communities, and of course, with the um, then um, whole society. I'm sorry, Shayla, ju just to ask you, can you just switch your, your because we can't see your full screen. I, I know you taught me this, but I managed to unlearn it <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> and Roger, you could, if you can turn off your camera and, 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 and mic as well. Sorry, people. We are is, it, is it all good? <laughs> You're us. Yes. You all good? Thank you. <laughs> no, I actually like seeing faces, to be honest. There's so many people and I'm feeling like I'm screaming into the void. So it's really nice to see people's faces. So that's, that's okay now, is it? Yes, it is. Good. good. Thank you. I was asking Roger, but he didn't react. So <laughs> Thank you. So just to continue, um, what this tries to illustrate is the importance of actually working with, um, with the in systemic approach to work and provide intervention on all different levels. Our clients um, are refugees, survivors of torture and trauma, asylum seekers, people who come um, escape their countries um, due to traumatic experiences associated with organized violence, persecution because of racism, religion, or se sexual orientation. Um, we provide services to a wide range of clients. So we see uh, people, uh, children, uh, we have early childhood um, services, um, therapists who work with early childhood. We work with elderly, we work with fam families. Um, it doesn't matter how long people have been in Australia, as long as they come from refugee-like backgrounds, we can actually see them. In our services, we actually see quite a lot of people who are second generation, sometimes even third generation, talking really quite loudly about the impact of intergenerational trauma and impact of violence it has on whole sort of generations of people. Um, when we talk about experiences that our clients go through, we know that they witnessed a lot of death, a lot of violence. They experience a lot of violence. See clients who've been uh, in prison, who've been tortured, clients who experience food deprivation, clients who lost their children because they couldn't feed them, uh, clients who have experienced rape and sexual exploitation. Um, people who, and children in particular, who could not say goodbye, who didn't know where they're going, what's going to happen to them. We see a lot of people who come and settle to Australians. Australia is not first country of asylum. It's often third or fourth or even fifth country of asylum. We also see people who have no education or have disrupted education. There are children who go to classroom and they middle of the day just get up and leave because they don't understand why they need to sit there. We also see people who have um, experienced tension in Australia and the impact of that. Some of these um, drawings and drawings of children I've seen, in fact, all these drawings are their dreams. Um, you can see dismembered bodies, you can see house, some fire and soldiers. So this is their experience. So what is trauma? Roger talked about it briefly. But I like this, uh, it's by Peter Levine. He talks about trauma is not in event, but in nervous system. And this is the only way to understand it in my mind. Um, so 
when humans are being threatened, organism try mobilizes freeze, um, fight, flight, or freeze responses. At some point after the threat is gone, um, this energy is not necessary anymore. The organism needs to discharge this energy. But it generally happens in cases where the stimulus is too intense, when there's no opportunity to discharge, or the trauma is chronic and complex, such as in developmental trauma. Energy is held in a highly aroused state. The self-regulation process is blocked or disturbed, and the result is physiological disorganization and appearance of traumatic symptoms. What we know is that the trauma challenges our basic beliefs that we are safe, that I'm valuable and good, that um, my world makes sense, um, and that I can trust people. And what you see, the pictures of, of Syria and war in um, um, Sudan, what you see is the reality of the experience of people that we uh, see constantly at start in our practice. But we know about PTSD symptoms that they um, pers persistently we experience the people, um, you know, associated with avoiding all the memory and all the things, triggers that we associate with the experiences. And we also know there's increased arousal. So here comes again, increased arousal. We know that other symptoms of complex trauma are problems with regulation of emotion, that this trauma changes relationship people have with their body, that sort of embodied sense of self morphs and changes. Um, they have destructive coping mechanisms, either abuse, substance abuse, or um, other ways of harming themselves in, in, in a sense. Um, they have changes in key cognitive schemas where they feel distrust and helplessness or hopelessness. They have problems with interpersonal function and new skills, being with other people and trusting other people. Um, all of this is also affected by problems with um, lack of control, feeling that they don't have control over themselves internally and externally, feeling re-traumatized by the new experience, a lot of guilt, a lot of shame and complex chronic grief reaction. So for young children, preschool, what we see is a lot of aggression, a lot of children who lose their verbal skills, who have more temper tantrums, which normally is something we see with much younger children. Um, they avoid new activities. They're often aggressive. Um, and often there's generalized anxiety, a lot of somatic complaints, tummy ache, headaches. Um, children have a lot of issues with sleeping. That's often the parents probably notice first. For school age children, um, I must say that often children refer to us by schools first, not so much by parents because parents are often frozen in their experience of trauma. They're not able emotionally to help and support the children. Sometimes there, there is a family dysfunctional issue and dysfunctioning of domestic violence as well. So we have a lot of children who refer to us by schools because of issues with concentration and memory, because of their aggressive behavior, because of the problem with inattention, because of somatic appliance, you know, not coming to school regularly. Um, so we, we see children who then also, we, you know, constantly talk about the events and um, the traumatic play. They have tendency towards magical thinking as well as an appropriate sense of responsibility. And really young children who take on particular roles that can also be cultural. With adolescents, we see a lot of unusually aggressive oppositional behaviors. Um, they may retreat, they often may um, decide to leave school and take more adult role. We've seen, um, and one of our colleagues has seen a child of 16 who actually since age five has been looking after his mom and two siblings and has been abused. He's been abused by people he worked uh, for. He has been also um, molested. Um, for him to sit at school and to listen to a teacher was a very hard thing to do. We also children engage in risky behaviours and sub substance abuse. We have a lot of problems with sleep. And also this age, I think there's a lot of hormonal issues, particularly for girls and issues with um, 
immunity. We see a lot, quite a lot of young people who have immune issues, gut problems, unresolved and constant IBS symptoms. This is a striking image. I decided to put it there. This is CT scan, and probably most of you have seen it. This is the impact of developmental trauma has on the brain. So image on the left is image of um, CT scan of Romanian orphan child who experienced extreme sensory deprivation, no human touch, no contact, no play. And you can see all of that in the brain. You can see the shrunken, um, terrifying brain in a sense. And I think this is really a good example of what trauma, in particular developmental trauma, does to human being. This is probably a very complex slide. I want to take you uh, through this because I think it's important. Roger talked about the complexity and I want to take you one step further and just explain that um, this is a study who is, that is also really um, important to read. So I think if you do have time, it's called Biological Effects of Childhood Trauma. There's a reference in the slide. And this particular um, slide talks about the impact of the trauma through middle, uh, through early to middle uh, childhood, adolescent, and into adulthood. This is a meta-analysis of all the studies done in terms of childhood trauma and PTSD and stress. Uh, chemicals, epigenetic effect as well, effect on the brain and nervous system. So what they found is that there's a difference in gender as well as um, genetic. Uh, there's a genetic risk. To, uh, of course, we know there's a socioeconomic impact of this as well, but trauma always has more um, deeper impact if it's done, if it's happened in early age and if the duration is, was prolonged. Um, and we also know the social support or lack of it plays quite a big role in this. So the stress response system is made up of different interacting systems that uh, work together to direct body's attention towards protective, uh, protecting the individual against threat, to, to shift these metabolic resources away from homeostasis towards fight, flight, or freeze reactions. The stresses associated with trauma events are processed by the body's sensory system to the brain thalamus, which is basically a relay station. All the sensory information goes through thalamus and then it's projected onto other parts of the brain. Thalamus then um, activates the amygdala, central component of the brain's uh, fee signal, um, and also uh, prefrontal cortex, which is where the exact functions are. Um, and also we see lots of changes then in executive functions. Um, it also impacts on hypothalamus, hippocampus, and activity increases the locus coriolis, the sympathetic nervous system. I know this is very complex, but I think it's important to understand that subsequent changes um, in some of these uh, reactions, as well as, as you can see in cateraminase, which are hormones that are secreted by adrenal glands, which are um, dopamine, neuroepinephrine, um, neuro I always have problems saying that one, and epinephrine contribute to changes in the heart rate, metabolic rate, um, blood, blood pressure and alertness, which in turn activates other biological stresses. Uh, there's also activation of, of the um, limbic hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis that plays a role in regulating body's responses to stress. And there's more cortisol, adrenaline in the system. What we also see that pediatric imaging studies demonstrate um, that uh, both cere cere uh, cerebral and cerebellar volumes are smaller in abused children and youth. The total um, mesagetal area of corpus callosum, which is the major um, interaction, interconnection between two hemispheres that facilitates intercortical communication, was smaller in um, maltreated children. Small cerebral volume were also associated with the onset of PTSD symptoms um, and negative associated duration of abuse. PCSD symptoms of intrusive thoughts, avoidance, and hyperarousal as well, dissociation correlate negatively with um, intracranial volume and total col colossal measures. 
Another study showed frontal lobe asymmetry maltreated children, also abused children in smaller prefrontal cortices, that's the seat of executive function again, as well as white matter in those in connect, connecting tissues, as well as the right temporal lobe volumes. There's a larger um, ve uh, ventricles, young age of onset um, and longer trauma duration was significantly correlated with smaller cerebellum volume. And we know that smaller, smaller cerebellum volume were also seen in institu institutionalized young people. Um, we also know that um, child maltreatment is associated with adverse effects in, in individual brain structures that are involved in reward and default network processing, as well as, um, you know, with, we know there's a lot of talk about, um, and one of the most consistent findings is that increased reactivity in the amygdala structure that's a brain's hub uh, to fear circuitry. Um, which translates um, behavioral to impulsivity and heightened response to threat. Other brain abnormalities are smaller hippocampus, uh, structural differences in insula, um, and also reduce gray matter in specific cortical regions. Um, we, I think one thing I found particularly interesting is that um, the brain sensory system, which serves to filter um, this outside world, um, is also sensitized or affected and modified in a sense to survive these experiences. So individuals exposed to high levels of verbal abuse from parents, for example, have reduced gray matter volume in their left auditory cortex and abnormalities in important language processing pathways in the brain. Uh, people who um, have primarily witnessed uh, observed domestic violence show gray matter changes in the visual cortex and decreased, decreased integrity in these um, fibers. And individuals who experience childhood sexual abuse um, also have a dilation in the visual cortex, particularly in parts involved with facial recognition as well as thinning in portions of somatosensory uh, cortex involved with the conveying feelings of touch um, in a clitoris and surrounding genital area. So we can see that there's this vast impact that the trauma has on the brain, on the nervous system. Um, there's a lot of talk about the uh, reduced oxytocin. Um, there's a talk as well about serotonin depletion. Um, there's also talk about impact on um, on uh, immunity, things such as um, um, cyto, um, such, such as cytokines and similar. So there's a lot of lot of impacts um, that are associated with the mental trauma. Roger mentioned AC um, E study, so I'm not going to go through it. Um, so we know that these impacts are vast and have quite severe um, um, impact on physical health, on the life, on the longevity of the person. I think another study that I found very interesting is the trauma in young people study done by Origin and as well as Phoenix Australia. Um, I like it because it talks about that beyond PTSD, you will have all these other symptoms which are psychosis personality disorders, issues of harm, suicide, um, eating disorders, and other things. Uh, but it also talks about uh, which are the groups that are most affected. It talks about the groups of out-of-home care, youth in justice system, refugee young people, homeless people, people with certain occupation, LGBTIQ young people, as well as, of course, Aboriginal, Torres Island young people being impacted all of this. So in summary, we know that self-regulation processes in blocking disturbed, resulting in physiological disorganization and appearance of traumatic symptoms. We know that brainstem, hypothalamus, limbic systems, neurocortex, um, in concept monitor relations with outside world and assess what is new, dangerous and gratifying. To accomplish this assessment, the brain needs to take in new sensory information to categorize its importance and integrate it with previously stored information. More importantly, it needs to 
determine what's significant and filter out relevant information. The organism needs to learn from experience to be able to um, and train a range of alternatives without becoming disorganized or acting upon them. We can see that the vast impact of this trauma, how hard it will be for somebody who's been through these experiences. Much of evolution human brains has consisted uh, uh, in developing the capacity to form highly complex mental images and collaborative social relationships that allow complex thought in the context of social system interaction with other people. In order to be successful, we need to be able to integrate all of this and to have self-interest and capacity to, um, you know, to adhere to these complex social rules. We know that people with PTSD, with chronic complex trauma, all dysfunction are compromised. And the degree of impairment determines not only by severity of the symptoms, but also the age of trauma has occurred and also if there are any support around them. So in terms of the arousal, what we know and what we see is that people are stuck in this traumatic stress. They cannot modulate their arousal throughout the day, throughout their life. They stuck either in symptoms of depression, flat affect, or lethargy, or rather frozen in fear. And the other symptom is being stuck in panic or hyperarousal. Uh, feeling this anxiety, hyperactivity, and not being able to relax, not being able to sleep, I and mean, lots of digestive issues, chronic pain, pain and high blood pressure. For me, in order to order this in my mind and to think of what really works and helps, um, uh, we at work, at starts, we use quite a lot of um, work done by Stephen Porges and Paul Vigo theory. Um, we know that theory talks about hierarchy, hierarchy autonomic nervous system. Porges says that um, there are three pathways to responses um, that are evolutionary and from oldest to newest, they go from dorsal vagus, which is immobilization, to um, system, um, sympathetic nervous system, which is fight-fight mobilization and to ventral vagus, which is social engagement and connection, which is more something that human or mammals, human as mammals do. Porges also talks about something that I think it's very important, called the concept of neuroception. Um, it is basically autonomic nervous system response to cues of safety, danger, and life threat from within our bodies and from around us and in connection with other people. This is different from perception because it detects without awareness. This is a subcortical experience that happens without the realm of our awareness. And this is very important in terms of all the trauma, in particular complex chronic developmental trauma, however, however you want to call it, because it talks about us reacting without even being aware of it, without being able to talk about it. And that's why, um, you know, with a lot of talk therapies, we find people cannot put into words, especially if the trauma happened in pre-verbal experience. What Pujas also talk, talks about is co-regulation as a biological imperative need that must be maintained to sustain life. It is thought that reciprocal regulation of, of our, our autonomic states, um, that we feel safe to move into connecting or creating trusting relationships. So if you're not safe, you're going to be going around being social, making a relationship. So we can think about autonomic nervous system as a foundation upon which our lived experience is built, how we move um, through the world, turning towards, backing away, sometimes connecting, at times isolating, is guided by these experiences of attunement, misattunement, uh, and we become masters of our survival. In each of our relationships, the autonomic nervous system is learning about the world and being um, torn towards habit of connecting and protecting. Another way of looking at this through this um, quite um, colorful slide, but we know that in terms of sympathetic, sympathetic nervous system, we know that sympathetic is engaging to flight and fight. Um, but we also know that parasympathetic is engaged in with its uh, with its dorsal uh, um, side into freeze response. We know that um, 
going from one to the other spectrum is not something where we want to be. And what we really want to be, it's this um, in that optimum way of functioning. This is another slide that shows complexity of the symptoms and all the organs of uh, veg uh, the, the, the vagal nerve that Porgy talks about innervates organs, um, the digestive system, the heart, the lungs, the face, um, all of this connected. So what we know is that um, what we want to do is to increase this um, um, when we are in danger, what child first wants to do it socially oriented, he wants to look at the parent, he wants to try to look for cues of safety, tries to engage. When that fails, it moves into either flight or fight. A lot of children in situation of uh, chronic abuse, they, it, there's no possibility to fight and there's often or no possibility to flee. So they move to then a the next stage, which is freeze response shut down helplessness uh, preparation to death when they actually feel quite trapped um, so all of this is important to understand why our clients react the way they react why they have the, why they avert their gaze why they don't look us into the face why they don't trust people why they don't trust people who are behind them so the key factor in this evolution is this propensity of social interaction and cooperation. Um, and I think there are a few things on this slide, it's quite busy, but just to say that in all cultures, mothers rock their children to vibration of the heart, which is 70 to 80 beats a minute. So there's this innate need, innate, um, smart, sort of evolutionary uh, way of us trying to regulate. Um, so, to socially engage, we have to be physically close enough to be able to read each other's faces, faces and facial expressions. Um, the muscles of facial expression and gesture with our hands, our vocal intonation, the prosody, the gaze, all permit to distinguish uh, voice of human from the voice, from the sound of the background noise. And also to um, um, link cortex to the brain step. Um, so this is very important to understand why then traumatized people have trouble reading faces, why, for example, a child that I've seen is constantly engaged in fighting with other children because they, he, she thinks that they um, hate her, they want to attack her. So she's ready to attack herself. So what does it mean, uh, mean in terms of the treatment? Um, so the goals of treatment and, and the goals of, you know, recovery goals are is to restore this safety, to enhance control and reduce this anxiety, to help restore attachment and connections and learn meaning and purpose of life as well as with the dignity and value um, by reducing shame and guilt. At starts we use multimodal approach to address this. And, and I'm going to particularly be talking about neurofeedback, neurotherapy that we do at STARTS, um, which is also done in combination with other therapies. Biofeedback, um, there are different types of biofeedback. There's galvanic skin response, there's um, heart rate variability biofeedback, which we also do at STARTS. And there's a muscle devices or EMG biofeedback. This particular form of neurofeedback, um, I'm going to talk about, it's called neurofeedback, but but why this is important. Um, in context of all the autonomic nervous system and the brain and impact, we know that biofeedback can basically happen, help to for people to understand the somatic reaction. It can help them regain internal control and shift focus from problem to solution. It increases mindfulness. Um, it provides information about psychophysiology and is great tool for psychoeducation. It works in arousal, it helps with sleep and attention. It's fun, it's empowering, and also gives clients opportunity to move away from that intense recounting of traumatic experience and depends less on verbal communication and starts to work a lot with interpreters. Um, this is very important, but this is also where we can communicate without communicating in a sense. 
So neurofeedback essentially is a tool to improve central nervous system regulation through um, holding a mirror to the brain, basically. In trends, the brain's ability to self-regulate is done by providing feedback on selected EEG rhythms related to regulation. You observe, observe brain actions from moment to moment, and it's simply biofeedback to the brain directly. You put sensors on the scalp, uh, and these ele electrodes, they measure brain wave activity. They send it to computer. Persons can see it in the form of the game. What you see at the bottom is the computer screen that therapists use. The person is effectively playing the video game with their brain. Um, so nothing goes inside the head. It's just reading the activity of the brain. Eventually, the brain activity is shaped towards more desirable or more regulated performance. So we're rewarding particular activity while trying to inhibit or discourage other activity. And once actually learned a good thing about neurofeedback is that there's a permanent learning after repetition. There's a growing body of evidence in the US for ADHD, it's level one best support intervention. Um, Basil has done study on PTSD symptoms and showed that there's a significant decrease in those symptoms and after this regulation. And Miriam, I will take a, a later talk about study that's um, done by Ruth Lanius on alpha down training neurofeedback and fMRI studies, as well as studies that start that. Um, at start, we have a neurofeedback clinic. Um, I'm not going to go too much into it, but it started in 2007. Uh, Mirena bought neurofeedback in 2003 or four. Since then, we work with very complex chronic cases. And a lot of our clients have experienced not just the war related trauma, imprisonment, and torture, but also developmental trauma. So, our cl clients have come to our uh, clinic through um, STARTS and general services. Other clients are more complex and more chronic. In order to support our work, we started last year, Australian Neurofeedback Institute, is to raise revenue. So we open our institute to wider public and other people who are interested to learn what to do their EGs to try neurofeedback or have ampli training. We are also privileged to work under the supervision of Jake Ankleman, who is an amazing QEG diplomat and taught us using EEG assessment. EEG is encephalogram, which is basically recording electrical activity on the surface of the brain. This is a whole cap. This is not neurofeedback when we only use a few sensors. I know some of these things might be a bit complex when you hear them first time. Um, so EEG shows how different brain waves um, from moment to moment and the brain, what you can see is uh, one second of the EEG um, in, in the screen. Uh, what you also see is different brain waves that are represented. So they're different, um, they're five brain waves particularly represented there. We know that clinical practice EEG is used to measure, um, to um, diagnose seizures or other um, epileptiform um, disorders. Uh, but with us, we use it to measure pro, pre and post uh, treatment as well as to guide our neurofeedback treatment. And what we also see in EEG is to confirm what we, what other studies in the meta-analysis have found is that there's a lot of um, hypocoherent alpha frontally, which points to mood um, and affect uh, dysregulation issues. So alpha is idly in rhythm. It's the rhythm that's associated when we actually relax but not you know asleep not, uh, not in that sort of hypnagogic state but we have this relaxed internal sort of attention um, and what we also see is that this rhythm is poorly organized posteriorly so it's uh, at the back of the head which inhibits our ability to relax and we constantly hypervigilant so what we see with our clients that even when they close their eyes at the back of the head we see that they actually still scanning the eyes and moving so they still trying to control the environment that's not comfortable with eyes closed. What we see in a lot of children and young people is a lot of issues with um, uh, temporal lobe changes, with the sensory processing issues. We see issues with attention focus um, which are frontal or central. Um, at the back uh, of the head is where we say the, the sensory processing and in 
you know, to situate in parietal lobes. And Sabin Fisher talks about um, the seat of sensor integration. He talks about um, this is where we sense uh, where all the sensations come in and they project it further. So if the input is not actually done properly, then the output will be also um, different. Um, and problematic in a sense. We see children, people having problem with the temporal lobes, with the emotional um, regulation, social cues, reading, as well as language processing, a lot of issues with also emotional numbing, um, sort of blunt and depressed affect. And in terms of the temporal slowway activity in young people and children, we know that the general population is uncommon in under nine years of age, but we see this quite often with our clients, regardless of the age. It's also seen in, in the ADHD population, in autism, and there's a lot of uh, similarities there, I guess. Um, and we also know that um, this impacts on people's ability to learn, because people's ability to engage in life and to feel accomplished, as well as having really a lot of issues with sleep that impacts on all sorts of other things. Now I'm going to go just to finish off um, a little bit more about multimodal approach. So neurofeedback is then in context of psychotherapy or any the other therapies that we do, uh, so solution focus, strain based perspective, CBT, MDR, um, narrative exposure therapy. We also use heart rate variab uh, variability, which um, Porges talks a lot about, in, you know, to regulate the vagal nerve through breathing through um, as well sound. Um, there's something called Safe and Sound Protocol developed by Stephen Porges, which works in middle ear to impact on the vagal nerve to basically um, uh, exercise that vagal nerve and the ear to hear the pitch of human voice, which is quite a lot of problems for people who've been through traumatic experiences. We have um, uh, physiotherapists, body workers, acupuncturists, nutritionists, um, to help us with this. We work closely with families and communities. We provide group uh, interventions and some of these school interventions are done at schools such as Capoeira Angola, our Lynx project, which is sporting project. So there are all sorts of activities that are very important. And I put these eight senses there at the bottom because I think it's important to understand that there's not only a sense of you know sight, hearing, taste, um, touch, or smell, but it's also proper perceptive uh, sort of sense of how do you feel in space. A lot of people, the children we work with, um, bump into things. They have no sense of where their body begins and finish. A child who's being um, on a sinking boat while um, escaping the country, coming to Australia for days and submerging in water age and two and a half, um, she will come to the sessions with, um, um, you know, shoelaces dragging behind her with the very loose clothing. Everything had to be unbuttoned. Everything was kind of dragging around. She couldn't stand to touch of water. She had problems bathing. Um, and um, teacher constantly commented on you know, her hygiene, but she just could not bear the touch of water. So that sort of sense of... of of you know where your body begins and end. A lot of other kids, um, people I see who are in your face who actually um, stumble upon you because they they don't know where their body um, stops. And also the first sense uh, I, I guess is the vestibular one. It's the gravity when we are born that ties us to where we are and how we feel. But if we don't feel grounded, how do we really actually feel the gravity? And that interception of, you know, bodily organs and what's happening inside our bodies. And we know that survivors of trauma are very much oriented to all these internal senses and external cues of danger. Um, so in terms of that, it's really important in thinking of multimodal approach. It's important to think of that holistic way, biopsychosocial approach in the sense of working with complex and chronic presentations. I want to thank you, and at the end, I just want to say this, which is my favorite quote, is that brains are exquisitely designed to be able to interact socially, to pay attention, to comprehend information, to achieve full human potential, 
to focus, think, reason, dream, and create. And if I didn't believe in this, I wouldn't be doing what I do because we see constantly changes and trans transformation. And I think doing neurofeedback um, helped me really um, stay and do this work much longer. I've been with STARS for 22 years and I very much enjoy what I do. Thank you very much. Leila, thank you so much for your presentation. It's, it's really amazing how much of this complex concepts from neuroscience you brought together and actually help us as clinicians understand the whole impact and also why we do what we do and how we choose interventions that, uh, that we do to support the recovery of our clients. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now we have five minutes comfort break, but also this is our time for our info commercial, but the best way actually to comfort us is to bring Seaburn Fisher, <laughs> who is our leader in the field of neurofeedback, who is a person who is behind all this process of integrating neurofeedback with psychotherapy to support recovery of uh, clients who are survivors of developmental trauma. So Seaburn, um, welcome here. We are so grateful for your presence today. And, and also, um, I, I think that this is our opportunity to talk about your webinar with us that will happen in February this year. So if you can give us just a few words on, on what we can expect um, as a treat today. <laughs> well, we, I, it'll only be brief. I just wonder, those are two fabulous presentations and it's always wonderful to see whatever way um, this work is taken forward and starts is one of the leading leaders in the field and needs to be supported with every bit of intentionality that can be brought to bear. Um, what I will be talking about really is uh, an overview of the latest neuroscience, which you've gotten a taste of already in these presentations, um, and but really specifically how this affects the brain into adulthood and uh, how we can work with that um, uh, in with psychotherapy and neurofeedback. Um, so I'm looking forward to this. Uh, it's uh, I will have hopefully quite a bit of time for question and answers so people can begin to integrate this into their thinking. It has come, I've been doing this now for 25 years and it's very clear to me, uh, abundantly clear that people with these histories of developmental trauma have a, uh, have a much better shot at recovery, at really full recovery and fulfilling the potential of that last quote um, with, uh, with if, we, if we can help them organize their brains and reduce arousal. So that's what I'll be talking. Sibrid, can you just tell us a little bit about your book? Because I, I think that that's one of the fundamental books that we have to read if we work with developmental trauma, uh, not just for those who are practicing neurofeedback, but for all practitioners in the field. If you can just tell us a few sentences about your book. Um, well, <laughs> uh, I was, I'm not prepared for this ad, so you have to know. Um, uh, I wrote a book uh, published by Norton called... Um, uh, neurofeedback in the Treatment of Developmental Trauma, which is not a title that I wanted. Uh, uh, subtitle, Calming the Fear-Driven Brain, which is the title that I did want. But, you know, it's a professional um, publishing outfit, so they had to have a professional title. Um, and uh, I really just go through the whole rationale uh, for uh, neurofeedback. I talk about my own and I'll talk about that a little on my own webinar about how I got into this because um, I don't know that I ever would have gotten into it listening to a webinar. I got into this because it had worked so profoundly for me and, um, and I keep discovering what neurofeedback can do uh, and how it enhances uh, psychotherapy. So that's what I wrote about and there are case studies throughout the book. There's one chapter of case studies, one of um, uh, DID, uh, one where the, uh, the, the, uh, my patient was pregnant and there was profound um, uh, quieting of fetal movement, which is really a case study that everybody should read and there should be, there should be um, clinical uh, follow-up on this to see if we can 
we can quiet intergenerational transmission of trauma. And the third person is someone who had Asperger's and an eating disorder was very quite treatment resistant. Uh, and so I go through what happened in each of those cases in every session and, or in summary, depending on how much you can tolerate the detail of these things. So uh, that was published in 2014 and I continue to learn. I continue to learn from Mariana among uh, other people. Um, so I'm, yeah, thank you. That's, the, there it is. It looks like even the cover has been bent a little. So I'm saying, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah. Uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm, I love, I wish I were in Australia often uh, these days. Um, and, uh, um, but I'm, I'm very glad to visit virtually. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. It's been wonderful. And I'll be, uh, I'll be with you for the rest of the presentation. Thank you. All right. So now that this, Five minute comfort break with Severn is finished. I would like to invite our next presenter. So Vivek, if you can show you as your face. Dr. Sharma has trained as a psychiatrist overseas with experiencing full spectrum of mental health settings from general psychiatric hospitals, high security forensic setting, correctional centers, community and private practice. He is currently neurofeedback practitioner at Headspace Early Psychosis and also in his private practice. Dr. Sharma has interest in treatment of complex mental health conditions such as developmental trauma with neuromodulation techniques such as neurofeedback. Welcome, Vivek. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mariana and Roger, for the introduction. Um, so I'll just um, share my screen. So I'll be talking about childhood trauma, developmental trauma, and, uh, and psychosis and neurofeedback. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and the literature around the, these different topics. So trauma has been defined uh, as a dehumanizing experience in which those subjected to it are reduced to subject status of objects, victim of someone else's rage, nature's indifference, misfortune, misadventures. It involves being plunged into a state of helplessness when physical control is lost. It's also been defined as, a childhood trauma has been, uh, is, is defined as experience of a highly distressing event or situation during youth that is beyond one's capacity uh, for coping and control. So, um, um, and so, so during my training in medical school and, and psychiatry training and beyond that, we read a great deal about how trauma and stress can modulate our autonomic responses, arousal in the short term and lead to affective and anxiety disorders in the long term. Uh, and same was taught about the gene environment interaction and double hit uh, theory of schizophrenia. But today's uh, presentation is basically relates to the evidence that has gathered over the years about the role of uh, uh, childhood trauma in, or developmental trauma in, in development of early psychosis and later conversion to schizophrenia. So research um, uh, has actually improved our understanding of relationship between early adversity and psychological problems in later life. And crucial to this research has been the role of childhood trauma, especially sexual and physical abuse and increasingly emotional abuse and neglect in, in these uh, difficulties. All the variety of other form of childhood adversities like parental loss, separation, discord, and bullying, they can contribute to later psychopathology, but childhood trauma, development trauma appears to have a particularly powerful and long lasting effect. Um, the, it has been associated with development of most psychiatric disorders, which include mood, anxiety, eating disorder, personality disorder, dissociative and substance use disorder. And more recently, uh, the role of childhood trauma in later development of psychosis is being discussed and it's been researched. And there have been some concerns about whether or not clients' uh, report can be trusted uh, with regards to the, their um, um, history of, uh, for example, trauma or abuse. But these fears are not uh, unfounded because uh, preliminary studies have shown that, Trump, that um, these reports are established and, uh, and also that uh, trauma-related uh, interventions can be effective in this group. Now, in a fairly recent review by Mayo et al. in 2017 
on incidence of childhood trauma in the, the CHR clinical high risk population, also called the ultra high risk in Australia. Um, and they also dealt with the uh, issue of risk conversion to psychosis. So CHR or UHR is a syndrome which is diagnosed on, on these semi-structured interviews. Um, the, the structured interview for psychosis risk syndrome and comprehensive assessment at, at risk mental state, which is one that we're going to use in our study. And it's based on uh, sub-threshold symptoms, psychotic-like symptoms like positive, negative, or disorganized symptoms, general psychopathology, the general functioning, and, and family history. And what they found was that, um, so this uh, review actually involved 24 studies, including 14 distinct samples, and, uh, and, and 11 of those samples followed the clients longitudinally in, long enough to examine whether childhood trauma was a risk factor for psychosis. Of these two were Australian studies. Um, so the summary was high rates of trauma were seen in uh, the CHR population, which was around 86% compared to the healthy controls. The, they were at higher risk of physical trauma than general population. Physical trauma was associated with also with poor cognitive functioning. The CHR youth, they endorsed a lifetime history of physical and psychological bullying, which was much greater than what was observed for the healthy controls. And they also found that bullying victimization is an important form of uh, childhood adversity, the effect of which can continue in, in, in adulthood. They also found that sexual abuse history um, is, is contributes to later mood and anxiety disorder, substance abuse, a PTSD, eating disorder, suicidal behaviors, and psychosis. They also found relationship between sexual abuse and high rates of positive symptoms of sexual nature uh, when they develop psychosis, such as feeling of being washed while bathing or hearing voices uh, regarding um, sexual statements. And, and in, in one study they, uh, on gender differences, they were able to show that stress sensitivity scores among the CHR females, but not males, mediated the association between the trauma and attenuated psychotic symptoms, which suggested that females cope with trauma quite differently uh, as they tend to internalize their, their experiences. Uh, and finally, they found a strong relationship between childhood trauma and severity of psychosis uh, in, in the CHR population. They also studied the role of significant life events, which are not traumatic, but they could not uh, see any substantial relation um, of that in, in development of um, psychosis. Childhood abuse, on the other hand, was associated with later psychosis conversion, uh, which is followed by physical abuse. And then in the end, they said that trauma appears to predict conversion to psychosis in CHR population, although the effect may not be independent of other known risk factors, such as more severe positive symptoms, cognitional functioning. In a more recent study by Morgan Dahl in 2020 this year. Uh, they, it's a quite large study, um, uh, case control studies called CAPC. They actually found two to four uh, fold increased odds of psychosis with increased adversity, uh, which kind of a dose dependent relationship and uh, can be seen in the, in the figure on the, on the right hand right side. They studied five types of adversities as household discord, psychological abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and bullying. And the odds were greater, greatest for who reported an early um, um, adversity or frequent, which was at least weekly, and severe adversity, which involved threat, extreme threat, hostility, or violence. Uh, and they also found that some form of adversity, such as bullying or sexual abuse, were more strongly associated with psychosis, especially if that occurred first in adolescence. And they made a point about brain plasticity or neuroplasticity, because that is a time when a lot of pruning is happening in young, mind, young brains. They're very sensitive to peer influences comp and comparison with, with others. Now, the, the mechanisms of how trauma can uh, be uh, relevant in the ultra high risk uh, individuals. They can be basically divided into cognitive, affective, and biological, or a combination of all. And what we know is, uh, is quite important uh, uh, factor in, um, in development of psychiatric uh, problems is uh, what we call a stress vulnerability model. It was given by Zubin Spring, and basically uh, talks about individuals having genetic or biological vulnerability of psychosis, and they can only withstand a certain amount of stress. And beyond that threshold level, the risk of psychosis 
can increase or risk of psychopathology will increase. So you can see that uh, stress is on the uh, on the y-axis and vulnerability on the x-axis, and and beyond this red line, um, you have either absence of symptoms or presence of symptoms. As as uh, and as the vulnerability increases, the uh, the effect of uh, stress becomes amplified. Um, the other uh, model is stress sensitization model, which is which comes from animal studies and also possibly related to the epigenetic effects of trauma. And an individual experiences their first psychiatric illness when they have a biological vulnerability, and um, and and have a major stressor. After this, the vulnerability can increase, um, uh, which require less stressor for the person to develop a recurrent or more severe psychiatric issue. And partial evidence has been was provided by Naples study in which uh, CHR individuals who converted to psychosis reported more significant life events and also had higher levels of self-reported stress than who remitted um, uh, in, uh, from CHR. Now, trauma and HP axis, there's a lot of talk about the HP axis um, and development of psychopathology, but um, how it relates to CHR, sam uh, CHR samples. Um, abnormality of cortisol secretion in CHR sample has been seen in compared to uh, um, um, healthy controls. Participants who converted to full psychosis had a higher mean cortisol level than the who did not. And maybe that may be related to the higher rates of mood or anxiety disorders rather than being central psychosis. But this dysregulated response with altered cortisol secretion is an evidence of subgroup which uh, ex experiences a uh, affective or stress pathway to psychosis. Uh, and amygdala, the role of amygdala and dopamine system is strongly involved in uh, in development of uh, later psychosis. Dissociation is also associated with later development of hallucinations. Some of the cognitive mechanism that has been purported to uh, uh, be involved in development of later psychosis are early adversity leading to negative schemas of self, others, and surrounding environment. These negative schemas are negative view contributing to greater external locus of control and symptoms of paranoia. Uh, faulty response to the environment um, can be seen in, in, in people who are traumatized, information processing biases for negative or irrelevant stimuli. So they're all mechanism, cognitive, biological, and affective, which may be uh, related to um, conversion to psychosis in people who are exposed. Now my next section is about QEG and psychosis and how um, uh, uh, you, you, we can see what are the findings in psychosis. So one of the advantages of QEG is that the EEG power spectrum is predictable and highly regulated by complex neuroanatomical and neurochemical homeostatic system. They have been genetically based and normative data are available and they have been established repeatedly. The economical, non-invasive, rapid, easy to change and process. And there have been successful treatment results on normalization of QEG abnormalities in these patients who have remitted. A study was done by Harris et al. Um, they took 40 patients and they basically did a principal uh, component analysis of pants uh, items and they actually supported uh, uh, like a tripartite model then instead of the positive negative dichotomy, which is reflected in the pants scale as well. And this could show that all the three subtypes were associated with distinct QEG characteristic. And there was no effect of medication or duration of illness on this. Then John et al, they took a um, large number of people who were diagnosed with schizophrenia, depression with psychosis, alcoholic psychosis across two continents. And they did cluster analysis of QEG data and they were found six clusters which were seen in both the data. And you could see that uh, patients with schizophrenia or depression with psychosis or first episode of schizophrenia, they were all seen in, in, in a single cluster. So which means that a similar underlying mechanism which were, which were, which were kind of regardless of diagnosis. I'm going to touch on neurofeedback research on psychosis. Bolia did an important study uh, where he reported one case out of 70 cases uh, that he um, saw and treated in a, in a um, uh, psychiatric hospital. And all were treatment resistant schizophrenia and been in patient for 20 more, more years. And they basically divided New York in three phases. I'm not going to go in details. But they found positive changes in almost everything. So uh, in, in terms of behavior, in terms of self-regulation, cognitive and affect regulation. Uh, 
and they were able, all able to most of them were able to resume community living after being in hospitalized for such a long time and two year follow up documented satisfactory adjustment and they were on low doses of medication so so it was quite um, um, important study that way sermeli at all in 2012 they actually did neurofeedback on a group of 51 patients with a duration of illness of 9 years at least and pen score more than 70 uh, which was average of 110 and there were some findings um uh, which is increased alpha increased theta hypercoherence and asymmetry based on qeg and they designed the protocols based on a uh, number of uh, uh, factors which were qeg deviant scores and present symptoms um such so as hypercoherence uh, broadband area 10 which is involved in working memory executive function Uh, emotional regulation broaden area 46 and fpo2 which kind of work uh, it's uh, has been borrowed from c1 fisher um who has worked uh, was kind of was a pioneer in this field has worked in treatment of severe uh, traumatizing developmental trauma and and some other symptoms and they 48 out of 51 completed the program the mean number of session was 58 uh, pens reduction was 82 and uh, um, 47 out of 48 shows response based on uh, the pens criteria so this was an, another important study and similarly pazuki et al uh, did a study in two clients with negative symptoms of schizophrenia more recently and they also found significant effect none of them met criteria for negative symptom pens so the benefit of neurofeedback you know if you can summarize is that it's because the medication effects are not consistent new antipsychotics can help with certain symptoms but perhaps not all and and that's why neurofeedback can be very helpful it can improve the new self regulation neural activity improve working memory memory um, uh, intelligence emotional processing so working on both left and right side of the brain and also major networks meta analysis has consistently shown that its neurofeedback is effective in adhd and, and epilepsy at least and uh, these uh, modulation are stable in 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 the long term and all uh, emerging evidence for other studies is 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 coming so i'll just end by saying that trauma assessment in uh, early psychosis services is important um both are difficult conditions to treat um the concerns about triggering trauma by asking about trauma are unfounded and the norms of interventions neurofeedback can be a really uh, if we, uh um helpful intervention uh, among the armamentarium for other trauma interventions that we have with early psychosis services so with that i uh, end my talk thank you thank you vivek for you know bringing uh, together two fields one in working with developmental trauma and psychosis and actually bringing to our attention that in working with young people uh, who suffer from psychosis we have to look for signs of developmental trauma as well and that um, interventions that we use in working with uh, clients with developmental trauma can be also then implemented in working with those who suffer from psychosis as well thank you for your contribution for our seminar today so and now i will briefly talk about uh research studies that were done in uh, on neurofeedback and uh, complex uh, trauma i will just share my slides with you all right so uh following now vivex and shayla's presentation um i will talk about the impact of trauma on those that were not treated on time i will talk about our adult clients survivors of complex and chronic trauma and i include here developmental trauma those who suffered uh, torture uh, also those who suffered war related traumatic experiences i will look at all these issues from perspective of neuroscience and give you some of our most recent data on the effectiveness of neurofeedback in addressing psychophysiological uh, effects of chronic and complex trauma and also how neurofeedback then can help to address uh, these effects first i will just briefly mention neurofeedback clinic uh, at starts so shay was talking about our clinic a little bit more uh, we receive referrals from 
our direct services internally for clients who do not respond to counseling and other interventions. And looking at our data so far, on what we've seen is that major reasons for referral to our clinic relate to severity of PTSD symptoms. Uh, severe somatic complaints such as headache, nausea, dizziness, tinnitus. And if we now put this through the SM5, uh, ICD-11, we can say that many of our clients actually could fit two to three or more diagnostic criteria for different disorders. They also come with different uh, physical health issues uh, and also with a range of other cas cascading effects on their employment, uh, financial difficulties, family problems, and all of that complicates their treatment and recovery. If we really look at the main symptoms that they are presenting with to our clinic, uh, we can see a range of symptoms related to PTSD and complex PTSD. But actually, if you're looking at the core of this problem, we can again say this is all about this regulated nervous system. So we can think about complex trauma first as a brain disorder and then as a, as a mental disorder. And to support this notion, in the next slide, I will show you a summary of research findings related to brain changes in trauma. It's a brilliant, brilliant research done uh, uh, later on uh, by Ruth Lanius and uh, her researchers. So first, just a little bit about uh, brain networks and, and trauma. Brain organizes itself through complex system of networks. Three major functional networks affected by trauma are default mode network, salience network, and central executive network. Default mode network is critical resting state network of the brain. It comes online when the brain is off task. And when we start to think about ourselves, others, it's our self-reflective -re space. It's important when we recollect autobiographical memories, memories of what happened to us, also to know what we feel and to have embodied sense of self. Frontal part of the default mode network is involved in our future-oriented thinking. Posterior part is involved in the collection of pa uh, past experiences and they need to work well together so that we have a coherent narrative of our life. Default mode network functional disruption in PTSD clients relate to negative self-referential thoughts altered social cognition and altered autobiographical memory. Salience network help us to figure out what is important or what is salient inside ourselves and in our environment. Also, uh, salience network help us switch between paying attention to the external and then to the internal world. And that's what healthy brain do all the time, switching between these two. So what is happening with those who suffer PTSD? Traumatized people are either hyper aroused and hyper vigilant, and in that case, everything becomes salient. Or they are hyper aroused, they are disconnected, they feel numb, they are not aware of how they feel, they are disconnected from their bodies, they are lacking somatosensory awareness. Third network affected through trauma is central executive network. This network is involved in the external world, so as an external world when we engage in thinking, planning, cognitive problem solving, um, judgment, decision making, then we pay attention to the, what's happening around us. Neuroimaging studies in PTSD suggest failure to properly recruit emotion regulation and also executive functioning areas within central executive network. So now we look whether neurofeedback can normalize these networks that were affected through trauma. So this is really brilliant research. Uh, Ruth Lanius is a researcher from the University of Western Ontario. And she and her team conducted double-blind sham control randomized trial. One of those that always in the, when something new is in the field, is that they're asked, where is your proof? Do you have double-blind sham control randomized trial? So she did one. They randomly assigned participants with PTSD to either receive neurofeedback, they're in the experimental group, or sham neurofeedback, and they're control group. 
and they collected resting state fMRI scans P and post neurofeedback for both experimental and sham controls. They also compared baseline brain connective measures pre neurofeedback to age matched healthy controls. For those of you who are neurofeedback practitioners, this protocol is actually to put sensor on PZ and then to down train A to 11 Hertz. So alpha rhythm desynchronization has been shown to restore resting alpha rhythm towards levels that are found in healthy people. Proposed mechanism is homeostatic rebound of alpha rhythms that is associated with shift the amygdala functional connectivity. So way for this posterior defense processing, threat processing uh, towards uh, prefrontal, video, uh, ventral medio, med medial prefrontal cortex responsible for emotion regulation. So now we have that better regulation of emotions, better cognitive processing, um, and less orientation toward processing of threat and, and traumatic memories. So what did they found following the uh, course of neurofeedback treatment for their PTSD clients? Post neurofeedback, they found significant decrease in severity of PTSD scores, but only in experimental group. And also after three months follow up. What is even more important is the remission rate for PTSD were significantly higher in experimental group, more than 61% uh, compared to shame control group that have far less um, clients who, who uh, recovered from, from PTSD. Now, if we now look at it, we, we, we now can see that there was a huge improvement in, in symptoms, but whether that also then in any way connect to changes in brain functioning. Uh, there, there are several areas of the brain that they show has changed or, or where functional networks has changed as a result of your feedback treatment, but I will mention only two. So looking at the brain changes, we saw significant changes in default mode network and salience network connectivity. And better neurofeedback performance, and that is during neurofeedback tr uh, training, looking at the reduction in power alpha activity, this correlated with increased right posterior insula connectivity with anterior default mode network. Posterior insula is involved in somatosensory processing as well as the ability to focus on body parts, on our senses and feelings that they generate. So clinically, what is expected then to see is increase in self-awareness, in self-referential processing, um, in embodied sense of self. And the second finding that stronger decrease in PTSD severity score that associated with less salience network connectivity with supplementary motor cortex post neurofeedback. And this could relate to reduction in hyperarousal, hypervigilance, and fight or flight defensive body posture. So this is, this is really fundamental research done in our area. And I encourage everyone who works with neurofeedback or who works with clients with developmental trauma to, to read this paper. The second study was done by Bezel van der Kock and his group of researchers and clinicians. This randomized uh, weightless control trial was conducted with adults with multiple traumas. An objective of this study was to investigate whether neurofeedback could substantially alter affect regulation and also PTSD symptoms. The authors emphasized that recovery from PTSD depends on ability to manage, manage intense arousal. And impaired affect regulation is one of the major causes why people drop out of this treatment. So if we can improve affect regulation, this will then reduce severity of PTSD symptoms, can decrease risk behavior such as suicidal self-harming behavior. Also it's shown in literature that reduce substance use and then that all makes uh, trauma treatment and exposure therapy more effective. So post-treatment, they also showed changes in PTSD symptoms in uh, in the group who received neurofeedback compared to controls. Um, what was really for me the more, even more significant is that changes in affect regulation preceded reduction in PTSD symptoms that in a way confirms their hypothesis. 
Um, what they also concluded is that neurofeedback may be particularly helpful for traumatized individuals who are too anxious, dissociated, or dysregulated to actually then tolerate exposure or other uh, treatment that are uh, trauma-based trauma treatments. Third study that we've just briefly mentioned is our own study that we are conducting at, at STARTS in partnership with the University of uh, Sydney and uh, West Mid Institute for Medical Research. And this is in line with, with Bezel's study. So we are first looking at potential neuromarkers for PTSD. So what we did, we gave our participants, our adult clients with chronic PTSD, cognitive task to perform. And it's go no go task that is designed to probe for basic cognitive processes while simultaneously me we measure brain activity or event-related potentials. We are measuring what is happening uh, with the brain in action. So clients were asked to watch for animal stimuli on the screen. And then if the second animal is stimuli, they need to press the button, that's go up condition. If the second uh, stimuli is a plant, they should withdraw or withhold from respond responding if that's no go condition. And then we compared results for our clients to healthy match controls that we obtained from a HIV database. So well, what we've seen is that one particular brain response was identified as deviant from the norm. And that is event-related a potential component that is called P300 because it's occurring 300 milliseconds after stimuli. And this brain response is elicited in the process of decision making. So this is when the, this, this in, in no-go situation when the second stimuli plant is elicited and decision is don't press the button. So it's actually measuring or uh, cognitive control. So for our client group, we could see reduction in P300, event-related potential component, uh, compared to healthy controls that you see as a red line. And then the next question was whether through neurofeedback we can improve on, on this ERP component uh, and whether after treatment we will get a normalization of this component or 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 improvement that, that would, um, that would uh, help, uh, help us to see whether they're improving in the, um, not just in their symptoms, but also in their brain functioning. So the second step was to conduct pilot study neurofeedback. And we had 26 participants, 13 were receiving neurofeedback, 13 were on a waiting list waiting to receive neurofeedback and they continued to receive um, treatment as usual. So this uh, study was done at starts in, in Sydney, Australia. All clients um, were seen even before they came for neurofeedback in our direct uh, services, and they were sent for neurofeedback because they, they, they had poor treatment response. So we were measuring then just for neurofeedback clients pre to post we are looking for changes in event-related potentials, and especially for that component, P300, that I mentioned before. So following their treatment, neurofeedback group had a greater reduction in symptoms of trauma, anxiety, and depression. Um, and also, um, we had reduction in the use of medications. So for neurofeedback group, uh, none of them continued to use medication while in weightless control, all of them were on the, on the medication at the time when they were assessed before they were admitted for neurofeedback treatment. And looking just at, at the group that received neurofeedback, we had significant reduction in PTSD symptoms. 12 of 13 had PTSD symptoms below the clinical significance score. And also we observe reduction in anxiety, depression, and we were looking also for changes in cognitive functioning. So you, we use digit span to look whether attention and working memory are improving, and that's, that's what was confirmed. And also what was for us a big relief, but also we were so excited to see that post-neurofeedback, we saw improvement in P300, 
towards normalization and it looked like more if you look at these uh, heads with the red color inside pre-post and compared to healthy controls, we could see that uh, P300 component has improved. It was reduced before, it's increased after neurofeedback treatment, and it's now closer to what we see in healthy uh, population. So there two from now. We are planning now to do simultaneous resting EEG and fMRI. Uh, to, that will give us substantial information about the relationship between hemodynamic response or variation in blood oxygen level dependent fluctuation and neuronal activity or brain electrical activity. This methodology can be fundamental for our understanding of fast dynamics of resting state networks that are associated with PTSD and their changes pre to post neurofeedback. So we, we believe that this study will really help neurofeedback practitioners in understanding better changes that are happening for post neurofeedback and what is happening on the brain level. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I will give access to our next presenter. So I'm inviting Aidan to join us. Aidan, are you here? Yes, I'm here. So this is our last presenter for today. Aidan will talk now, now about the plan that uh, Headspace had, uh, has um, on a neurofeedback uh, pilot study. Uh, and um, then we will conclude with uh, remarks from Roger. So Aidan Anich is a research assistant for the, this project uh, that is run at Headspace Early Psychosis. He holds a master's um, of research in psychology and He's nearly com uh, completing his PhD in psychology. Thank you much. Thank you so much for being here. And I don't know, uh, is your turn. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Let me just bear with me. Let me just share my screen if I, if I can. Okay. Okay. That should be up now. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Miriana. And thank you, Roger, for the, for the warm welcome. Um, so... I'm just going to be running through the aims of the project, um, the expected outcomes and the protocol of, of this pilot study uh, that's been run um, at, at Headspace. So essentially the aim of the project is to improve clinical and life outcomes for people with early psychosis and developmental trauma. And we're using uh, neurofeedback um, to, to, help, to help with that. Now, the, the strength with neurofeedback is that it is, non-invasive, um, unlike, uh, for example, uh, uh, brain stimulation techniques such as TMS, um, it is safe to administer and it has been shown to be uh, very effective in treating other psychological disorders, for example, schizophrenia and uh, Vivek, uh, my co-panelist, uh, summarized a few studies um, that, ex that examined schizophrenia with neurofeedback. So the the most important aim of this project is to address the cognitive def deficits that are associated with early psychosis, so there could be a reduction in attention or sustained attention, and the symptoms of early psychosis, so the negative symptoms and the positive symptoms of, um, of early psychosis. Um, and we, like I said, we just want to use neurofeedback to mitigate the functional decline that is associated with early psychosis and, um, and developmental trauma. So, sorry, let me just see if my slides are working sorry ah um so it will help if i <laughs> go to the next slides so those are the project aims sorry i'll just um i'll just put that up there uh, for your edification um so why is this why is this important so we want to individualize treatment uh for for people that have uh, early psychosis and, and developmental trauma uh, because people's um, and this is, sorry, this is just a key strength of the study um, because on an individual by individual basis, um, th their personal experiences, their developmental trauma history, their, the symptoms and severity of symptoms of psychosis may differ from person to person. So uh, it's not a one size fits all model in, in other words. So we want to personalize treatments using neurofeedback to each person. Um, and as neurofeedback has been has shown promise in the treatment of other uh, psychological psychological disorders such as schizophrenia, which I mentioned earlier, we wish to extend this to early psychosis and developmental trauma. 
And the focus of this treatment is to improve functionality overall, so cognitive functionality, um, help build autonomy for the individual, help them build and maintain interpersonal relationships, which is a, a marker of early psychosis, and uh, an overall um, and improve their overall quality of life. So if they want to re-engage in work and study and be a functional member of the community. So let me just so just why this is important that up there and just a protocol for the study so participants are categorized as experiencing a first episode of psychosis so they they um, definitely show symptoms of psychosis so they may have hallucinations they may be hearing voices or both and they are referred to headspace or they are at ultra high risk um, of developing psychosis and this is assessed using the comprehensive assessment of at risk mental states um, which is uh, also known as the CALMS. Um, so, sorry, pardon me. Um, before um, any neurofeedback or any measures are taking place, informed consent will be obtained from the participant uh, where it will just detail the specifics of the study and, and detail uh, what will be administered and what will be measured. Uh, this is a case series where each participant will serve as their own control to measure their respective outcomes. So participants may have engaged with Headspace services for a number of years, or they may have just begun engaging in Headspace services. And like I said, they will just be served as, as their own control. So there's no, um, it's where they, where they start and where they, where they end up after the, after the project. Um, in the early psychosis program, it includes a, a thorough assessment. Um, so a standard set of pathology testing um, that includes autoimmune disorders and fMRI scans will also be obtained from each participant. So the following measures will be administered to assess progress, and these assess um, um, specific domains that we that we are interested in. So these uh, measures will be uh, completed um, at the initial registration of the study and every three months. Um, so for example, the brief psychiatric rating scale, which is a 24 item uh, scale that measures uh, certain uh, psychological and psychiatric symptoms, the Kessler um, Psychological Distress Scale, or the K10, uh, the Social Occupational Function Assessment Scale, or the SOFIS, um, Recovery Star and My Life Tracker. This project will also include the TOVA, or the Test of Variables of Attention, which is uh, a computerized um, uh, program that measures sustained attention. Uh, QEEG, uh, which will be measured pre and post, which is, an, is just a measure of uh, brain activity and brain response to neurofeedback, and the MACE-X, and the MACE-X will be administered once um, before the study commences. Taken together, these measures will assess uh, clinical outcomes, so symptoms um, that um, people may experience as a result of developmental trauma and psychosis, cognitive um, uh, cognitive aspects, uh, sustained attention as measured by the TOVA, and most importantly, life outcomes. So engaging in social activities, in re-engaging in work and study, being a, a member of the functional member of the community. So um, just to summarize briefly what these scales are. So the MACEX is a retrospective questionnaire about the participants' experience of maltreatment and abuse during childhood. One domain of this, um, it's a 75 uh, question, question um, item questionnaire. One domain is emotional neglect with five questions. And a sample question includes um, mother unavailable for poor reasons. And the pass participants score this um, at, at the frequency and at, at which age this, this may have occurred. The test of variables of attention or the TOVA is a computerized continuous performance task that measures sustained attention and improvements are measured um, by reduction in reaction time. And this will be taken pre and post. The brief psychiatric rating scale is, um, like I said earlier, measures psychiatric symptoms. Um, but most importantly, is actually very sensitive to sim symptom reduction after certain interventions. So again, this is going to be a pre and post um, measure. Um, example items of the BPRS include emotional withdrawal, withdrawal unusual thought content, and hallucinations. The Kessler uh, Psychological Distress Scale, or the K10, 
um, measures unspecified psychological distress and physiological states. And it's just a, a brief surface level understanding of the participants' um, current state. The social occup and occupational functional uh, functioning assessment scale, or the SOFAS, is a present measure of um, social, um, for example, interpersonal relationships and work study functioning. Recovery star is a scale um, that is scored by both the clinician and the client in 10 domains of life, for example, managing mental health and physical health, and is a measure of recovery. And lastly, my life tracker is a brief mental health measure of five domains uh, of life for youth aged between 12 and 25, for example, general well-being and relationships with friends. So those are, are the measures that we are going to be uh, using. Um, sorry, pardon me. So just um, briefly on QEEG, uh, like I said earlier, it will be measured pre and post um, neurofeedback. And, and this will assess the effectiveness of neurofeedback on, on brain function, generally speaking. Um, so essentially, we'll be focusing on absolute and relative power, asymmetrical improvement and coherence. Um, and this allows for, a for us to target specific brain areas with neurofeedback. Um, with respect to neuro, neuro, um, with neurofeedback, 30 to 50 audiovisual sessions over the course of study will be administered to each participant. And this will depend on the participant and, and, and their um, specific symptoms. So it is a non-standard neurofeedback procedure with each session um, uh, to be tailored to each participant. And we also want to assess the feasibility of neurofeedback in early psychosis and developmental trauma. And lastly, just the expected outcomes. So we expect to see a reduction in scores of the K10, BPRS, and the TOVA. These are marked improvements in psychological well-being and cognitive function. Improvements in social functioning and overall quality of life will be measured on recovery star, the surface, and my life tracker. And QE, QEEG data will be will also be obtained to a measure brain function and as a result of neurofeedback intervention. Um, every, uh, uh, thank you everyone for, for your time. I just want to um, that that was just my very brief summary of of um, of the project and the and the protocol. Um, I do appreciate your time and and uh, and attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Aiden, for your presentation. Good luck with your research. I'm oh, sure you. that young people will benefit from, from this intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Mirana. Let me just um, stop sharing my screen. Uh, so I would like to invite Roger uh, back now to, for his final remarks and to close this seminar. And I would just ask then each presenter to stay with us uh, at, at the end. Um, there were a lot of questions that you asked, meanwhile, all of them are collected and as we don't have time to answer them today, they will be answered at a later stage, so uh, all of you will have a chance to get our answers to your questions. So Roger, could you please join us again? Let us see, there is a Roger. I hope that Roger is still here with us. Okay. Sorry, I will just call Roger. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Okay, so Roger is on the phone. Let's see what uh, what is happening. Maybe he dropped out and his connection was not good. So there was, there was a lot of information that we provided for you today. Some of them were quite technical. Uh, we tried to really put together for you experiences that we have as clinicians and also to talk about research that gives more validity to what we do. 
And also, I really believe that today's seminar is important because it's bringing together two really important uh, areas of work, uh, raising awareness about the impact of developmental trauma on development of psychosis or maintenance of psychosis, and all, also that is really important for clinicians who work with psychosis to always check for developmental trauma. And I believe that not just neurofeedback, but other interventions that are used to help those who uh, suffer developmental trauma uh, in their recovery. So this is very important. There were some questions about how to recognize signs of, of trauma and, and importance then for training for clinicians who work with uh, young people who suffer from psychosis to uh, understand how to ask questions around trauma uh, and then how to uh, use interventions that we use in the field of, of trauma to help their clients. So I really believe that, that this dialogue is very important and I hope that we will continue to, uh, to provide more information and training. Um, next seminar with Seaburn Fisher in February will give you more information on, on this, in this field. She will talk more about impact of, of trauma on brain and, and also then how we can use tools that we have in our case neurofeedback to help clients recover. Um, if there are any other questions that you have, please post them now. We will collect them all. You will have slides available uh, and also a recording of our webinar will be available on the platform where you registered for this webinar later. And uh, uh, you will you'll be able to access them probably in a couple of days. So Re Roger is here with us now. Uh, our apology for the, it looks like there was a problem with connection. Sorry about that, but the system decided it needed to close me down because it wanted to update Microsoft. Oh, Roger, that wasn't the best timing. <laughs> oh. Uh, let me just get the slides up and away we go. Okay, so thank you everybody. I hope that um, you found our presentation stimulating, uh, but now there's a question of where to from here. So uh, Headspace Early Psychosis, uh, as I mentioned before, is a model that already is world's best practice. It includes 16 components of care. And I think as Aidan was talking about the different tools, we're not, they're not just for our research. In fact, uh, most of those things are done routinely by our staff every three months to meet the Commonwealth um, minimum data set because we're very highly scrutinized and evaluated. So the, the only new things we'll be adding really are the TOVA, the MACE and the quantitative EEG. So we know we already score well on reductions in symptoms, improved physical health and well-being, in completion of education, in achieving employment and in social functioning compared to national benchmarking and in, and in international comparisons with similar first episode psychosis services. So as I said, our, our program is highly scrutinized and evaluated and there's also a fidelity tool and we get inspected to make sure we're meet, matching that fidelity. So we have 16 components of care already being implemented. So, uh, just going to try to get this slide to move. For some reason it won't. So I just bring this slide up because, um, in fact, um, we're working at a very important period of brain development from 12 to 25, when the brain stops growing and switches to pruning uh, connections for efficiency. So it's also the time that evolutionary behavioral programming changes from being a dependent child to competing with your peers, for the best mate to produce the next generation. So in this period of high brain plasticity, operant conditioning with neurofeedback has an excellent chance to produce faster functional improvement. This is also likely to be true with EMDR and other treatment that changes brain function. 
but it's also a great time for secondary prevention before young people become parents. So looking around the literature, what we find is that there are real themes emerging about stages of therapy uh, that we should be following. And these things overlap like most things in development. So you really have to achieve engagement, trust and education. And I use The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk as a good tool. Uh, therapist relationship is really important because almost all our young people actually have attachment issues as well. We need to first of all do the brain re-regulation and that includes the range of um, aspects of brain functioning. So it's not just um, you know, getting the brain calmed down, but it's also the issues of proprioception, sensory input, the autonomic, et cetera. So there are a range of processes to do that, including yoga and mindfulness, capoeira and gola. And for, particularly for girls who have been sexually assaulted, martial arts can be really helpful. But then we should move on to uh, things like EMDR or tapping acupuncture points that, again, change brain function. So they're, they're not talking therapies. They're really about things that improve brain ability to then get involved in talking therapies. So people still need those as individual or group or art or sand tray therapies because people do need to have meaning and also that can include issues of some exposure to types of uh, trauma but also people really need to manage their physical health. And we all we certainly supply information on diet. We have had exercise physiologists involved. We want people to manage their well-being. But single office-based clinicians really can't provide this range. So it's best that people are part of an integrated community, a sort of comprehensive service with enough critical mass for the full range of skills, group therapies, and for efficiency. So therefore, there's a real need for a comprehensive service that emulates the best of origin and the STARTS models to treat the effects of developmental trauma, no matter what their initial symptom cluster. Based on genetics, some will need medication as a component of care. So while more intensity of treatment is required at the beginning, the brain does find its own solutions and the effects are long-lasting. And that showed up on those studies by Belia and Smelly in psychosis. So evidence shows that while a minority of high, ultra high risk category go on to develop schizophrenia, they all have very significant life issues, usually associated with developmental trauma. So we find it virtually impossible to find a suitable service to refer these young people uh, with developmental trauma to. So this is vicariously quite traumatic for the caring staff involved. And I certainly find this in my small private practice with traumatized adults. So our case series, um, any, um, also, needs to, there needs to be complementary programs. Hang on, just go back here. Uh, what I'm saying is that really um, to put money into services that are going to treat the developmental trauma are really a great investment opportunity because there are these factors of minimum risk, improved functioning, long-term benefits, whole-of-life benefits, etc. So for any... Um, government setting it up, we really need to also to have those complementary programs in place. You need to be dealing with all phases of life. But for any government, uh, federal, state, or a philanthropist, it would be a great investment with worldwide implications. So thanks very much for watching our webinar, and um, we hope that uh, you've picked up something from it, and we'll certainly be sending out a link to the resources on our website and we'll keep you informed about progress, and we'll also be including additional written materials apart from the webinar. So thank you very much, and I'm sorry for that interruption. I would like now to invite all panelists and Steven to just once more show your faces, and also Nicola and Rosario, who are who were with us all this time in sending you reminders and messages and organizing our mailing campaign and who helped us with, uh, with this, all difficulties that we technical difficulties that we had while we were preparing this uh, seminar for you. Um, I would like you to talk uh, also really thank sincerely all our panelists for this great work and, and a lot of preparation that went into today's uh, seminar. Um, 
and I wish you luck with the uh, research study that you're uh, going to do. Um, this is a great study that, that, is, uh, that you're planning to, to do. And I believe also that our uh, cooperation between our services will help us to keep developing our understanding of how we can implement neurofeedback and how we can work more effectively with uh, developmental trauma. Uh, thanks to all our, um, to today, to our audience who stayed with us during this whole presentation. That was quite complex, it was packed, there was a lot of information that we exchanged. We will answer your questions later, so uh, none of your questions will stay unanswered. Uh, we hope to see you uh, for our next seminars. Um, all the best to all of you, wherever you are in the world. Um, goodbye and um, see you next year.